from the nation's capital, this is the Fly Fishing Consultant Podcast with your host, Rob Snowett. This is the 230th episode of the Fly Fishing Consultant Podcast. My name is Rob Snow White, and this is part two of my day trip in the Cotswolds with Andy Gray from andygrayflyfishing.com. In this part of the podcast, Andy takes me down some winding roads, and I'm on what I consider the driver's side. So when all these cars are coming at us on these little blind turns, I'm reaching for the brake, and it's not there. Again, I had white knuckles. Andy takes me to a still water, which was crystal clear, had little bridges built on to the islands, and had little casting platforms just to get you out a little bit further. We were sight casting a rising trout. Buzzers were coming off. The wind would pick up. The wind would die. I finally got my chance to fish a jig fly, and I ended up breaking off trout. This was my first chance ever to experience blue rainbow trout. So this is part two of the Fly Fishing Consultant Podcast goes to London out to the Cotswolds outside Oxford. And I told you how Andy works in the music industry. Well, he's friends with the obscure band Gold Rush that I use for my introduction music. How's that for a small world? Hope you all enjoy this one. Next podcast, we're going to the London Fly Fishing Fair. Okay. So we're just coming out of the River Colne Valley now. The Colne is uh, another tributary of the Thames. We're going to drop back down into the the Windrush Valley, which is further east, which is another Thames tributary, and we're we're going to climb up and then drop down into the Evenlode Valley, which is the third tributary. Um, And all these, uh, we're moving kind of east all the time, so we're getting we're getting uh, basically closer to closer to London as we as we move. as I say, you, you'll see the difference in the rivers as, and the quality of the water on the rivers as we move further east. Um, and we saw the leech. The leech is actually a tributary of the Thames as well, a very small one, uh, as is the Colne. And you've seen the wind rush, you've seen the quality of the water in there, then we're going to go and see the even load and you can see the difference. As we, as we move further east, it gets worse, but conversely, as we move further west, the fishing really improves. A lot of small, small streams around here. Uh, which don't get fished a lot, but they all hold wild trout. There's so many of them in this area. Um, but, you know, creeks, as you'd call them, and really, really small, small rivers. We're going to go back across the leech in a minute, which is where you jumped out to about about across earlier. Yeah. How long did it take you just to find your way around? Um, well, I'd say, you know, about 20 years ago, I was, I was fishing four or five days a week. Because all these buildings, like they are made of the same material, they kind of all blend in. Yeah. Let's see. No, I remember the small one from earlier. So we would have a mirror over here on these turns, so you can see when a car's coming. You do sometimes, but not the count. The um, government don't put them up. Do you cars know, people... ever go through these houses? Mm, not that often. You know, most people are pretty pretty aware of uh, driving around here. My wife would be grabbing the dashboard every five seconds and going, oh! <laughs> yeah. yeah, there's a bit of an art to driving around these small lanes. Yeah, this is absolutely yeah, majestic right yeah, there. It's just absolutely lovely, isn't it? Full of fish. Absolutely full of fish in a really, really good environment for them. So you've done GTs, you've been in Mexico. Are there other bucket fish species you want to catch? Um, I've not caught a permit yet, but very few people have. I've had a few shots. Um, what's next? Tuna, I think. I've caught some um, false albacore, which is part of the tuna family. Caught quite a few of those of the Caribbean. But um, no, I think I just wanted the saltwater thing is. Um, it's really addictive, you know, it's really addictive. And uh, I just want to spend more time bone fishing and refining my bone fishing and my fish spotting. Because that, I find, is the most rewarding part of it. 
you know, to actually see a, see a bonefish and get the get the fly in the right place. Living here and then going to the tropics is you really have to worry about the sun. Yeah, yeah, you cover up a lot. I mean, you tend, you know, I'm out a lot in the summer, so you know, I build up a, a kind of not kind, sorry, a. Uh, It's a small kite, yeah. Or is that a hobby? It might be a hobby. I'm not very good on the birds of prey. But no, you tend to build up quite a tan over the summer. Then you have all day. Yeah, one of my neighbours about two weeks ago commented how pale I was looking. That'll change. Yeah. <laughs> but no, I mean, as far as fishing destinations, I want to go back to the Indian Ocean again. Um, but that's... It's, it is expensive, whereas you know Mexico, you can you can do it reasonably cheaply. Like I said, that trip I did in January, I did a DIY. Just a friend and I went out there, and we had a great time. And the the satisfaction of catching a catching your first fish solo, you know, without a guide, is just immense. You know, because as you know, I mean, as a guide yourself, you're catching fish for people a lot of the time. You know, they, they might be holding a rod, but you're catching the fish for them. Is that the imminent collision warning? Uh, it's just a... <laughs> yeah, right, there's a stall, stall indicator. <laughs> that, that one guy running was pretty brave. like this all the little country roads around here. So we're going to climb up a little bit up to the, what's basically a crest back through Burford into Windrush Valley and then back out of Burford into the Evenhoe Valley. are huge here. Yeah, a lot of pigeons about. And they breed two or three times a year now. Oh. That's one bird you don't really see in a fly time. There's so much iridescence on them. I know, yeah, it's, it's funny, isn't it? It's, um, and they're so common as well, you know? Yeah. The amount of starlings we have, I think those would be more popular. Really thick brush. Yeah. Well, this, this will just go bang green in about months' time. Do you have clients that bring their own flies they want to try and you look at them and you're like, yeah, I don't know. Yeah. Like, you can try it, but. <laughs> the servant normally. Um, someone will turn up, you know, if, if I've got a, a river client, they might turn up with a fly box and you know, there might be something in there, but normally they're much too big. You know, they've, they've bought a, a, a job lot of flies, you know, river flies from a shop or something, or a, you know, a pack of flies, uh, and they're normally just big, massive, size 10s and 12s and stuff like that, and they go way overdressed. That's the, the biggest bugbear is, is overly dressed flies. Because you look at the natural insects, they're slim, they're thin, you know. They're not big, hairy things. Did Frank Sawyer, was he out here? 
He was further down south on the Avon. Uh, the Avon, there are about four Avons, four river Avons in um, in the UK. Uh, but the it's the Southern River Avon which he was the river keeper on. This is a really pretty stretch. Yeah. I've just bought up some of his imitation killer bug yarn. Oh, the uh, what, what, Shetland what Shetland what oyster four seven one or it's called. Yeah, it? that yeah. stuff is. I've seen it on eBay for about a hundred dollars for maybe a couple. For of original years. card, mm-hmm. yeah. I've um, I've fished the stretch of river quite a few times, which he was a river keeper on. And there's, I think it was a picture on my Facebook of me sat on his sat on Frank Sawyer's bench. Um, the killer bug was basically called the killer bug because he used to kill every grain he caught. And funny enough, very very first time I ever went river fishing, I uh, was on the River Tweed in Scotland, a place called Melrose. Tweed's known as a salmon river, but it's got a good head of trout and, and grayling as well. And um, I bought a day ticket. Well, my father bought me a day ticket because I was about 12, I think. And it had the rules on it, you know, what the fly size you could use, upstream only, or sort of thing. And the very last rule was all grayling to be killed. That's a rule? That was a rule. Wow. Yeah. Um, Things have changed. Well, salmon fishermen um, always used to think that grayling ate the salmon right salmon eggs so you know why would you want a grayling in the river in a salmon river because it was destroying the grayling it was destroying the salmon rather so again they were persecuted and seen seen as a bit of a pest um, there's again there's been a big explosion in grayling fishing in the UK you know because people have seen them as a, a very very worthy game fish uh, and also you can extend your season because when the trout season finishes the grayling season is still in in effect so that river we were just on, it's closed for 18 days every year. And then it's open for the rest of the year. The river seasons do vary. The season in, for instance, in Wales it starts, I think, the 14th of March. So the Welsh rivers are open now. Where is it? It's 1st of April here. When do you use the two-pronged hooks? Is that mostly for salmon? Doubles, yes. It's a salmon and sea trout. No, normally always a double. Is that just to help them when really they jump? It's just a better hookup. Um, you don't use doubles for trout. Um, use for trebles now. People don't really use trebles for salmon anymore. A few people do. All the salmon fishing I've done has always been the doubles. How far do you have to go to get to, to salmon? Well, the nearest salmon fishing to here is the, the River Wye, which is west, probably about 40 miles away. Um, the Wye, I mean, salmon fishing in, in the UK, it really is in, in decline. I mean, Scotland had a terrible season last year, but that may bounce, bounce back, you know, it's very... Cyclical. Yeah. Uh, I, I mean, I say the Thames used to have a massive salmon run, you know, two, three hundred years ago. But you know, they're coming back into the Seine in Paris. Yeah. I read an article a couple of years ago. Well, say so you'll get you'll get the odd bait fisherman who will catch catch a salmon on, in the Thames. In fact, there's a very small river further north of here, Warwickshire called the River Stour, which is a really interesting river. And it's absolutely full of trout. It doesn't really get fish for trout that much. A lot of bait fishermen, though. It's a little short there. I love the signs. Yeah. It's painted. Uh, but there's uh, a guy there who I know is a good friend of mine who's a bait fisherman. And um, he's, one, he's one who actually told me they were trout in the river. So I fished it quite a bit. And he, I said, what's the biggest trout you've caught? And he said, oh, he said, I caught a massive great thing once. I said, how big was it? And he said, oh, it was about, it was about a two foot long fish, you know, maybe two, two and a half foot long. And he said, but it's really skinny and really black. And I said, okay. <laughs> Did it have a big hook under the, on the lower jaw? And he went, yeah, a really big hook on the lower jaw. So that wasn't a trout. I said, well, said, you've, I said you've caught a salmon there. No. Yeah. 
What was the name of that little village? Uh, that's Burford. There's a lot of um, towns with Ford in the name because it obviously means water crossing. Um, Burford's the crossing for the Windrush. Um, Fairford is the crossing for the coal. So we're now heading up the hill and we're going into um, the Evenlow Valley. Well, we're going, coming out of the Windrush Valley, up and over into the Evenlow Valley. So that looked like a new building that was made to look old. Yeah, the building regulations mean if you build an old, if you, any new building has to be built out of the Cotswold stone. Yeah, to try and keep everything looking nice and, you know, conforming with what the traditional look was. And you start to see a change in the colour, particularly the older buildings, as we get more towards Chipping Norton, they become lighter and a more buttery colour which is because you know as the stone changes because the stone to build these buildings out of would have been quarried you know within half a mile of where they're built you know because when they're built three four hundred years ago they wouldn't have carried the stone very far and it does change in colour as you move around through the Cotswolds to what is the highest part of Oxfordshire now. If I can just see on the, well, in a bit you'll see on the right hand side, there's a little very low sort of hill, which is the, the, highest, the highest point in Oxfordshire. Just so the a little village called Leafield over to the right. Nobody rides bicycles out here, do they? Uh, you get quite a few cyclists. Leisure cycling is just really big now, you know. It's been a big explosion in it. I mean, the British did quite well in a few cycling events over the last few years, and it's really what we call Wimbledon effect, you know. Week after Wimbledon, everyone goes out and buys a tennis racket. My wife, growing up, her and her twin brother would watch Wimbledon and then just go play tennis all day. Yeah. I can't play tennis, so we, I don't want to play against my wife. She would probably hurt me. It's a lot of black chickens. Yeah. I wonder if those are breast chickens? Uh, I don't know. Chickens? I've never seen a field of, like, a field of cows, but chickens. Just all just walking around happy, heavy birds. Free-range chickens? Yeah. When I went to Paris... I, I couldn't believe how different chicken tasted. Everything we eat is just so mass produced and just gross. Yeah. A lot of my friends hunt, just, they don't want to eat antibiotic hormone filled grossness. No, I mean, it was so, again, there's a, you know, a big movement in the UK now for, for real sort of free range, you know, naturally grown food. There's so much estrogen in our river. All the male fish have eggs. Yeah. From the not just from women on birth control, but all the stuff they pump into the cows to make them produce more milk. Oh yeah, that makes sense. And it just lactate. Yeah. yeah, it just they piss and it all goes into the Potomac, and you cut open a, a male fish and it'll have eggs in it. Crazy. Right, this is the Evenlow Valley we're dropping into now. It looks like a tweed coat. Yeah. Patchwork quilt. There's the forest. Really buttery yeah. colour stone now, it's really lighting up. Right, well, we'll let's go to a trout fishery. Let's, uh, let's get you wet in the line. So even like a small creek. Yeah. Just have fish in it, just end up there. They will probably run up there to spawn. Uh, uh, a lot of those are what we call winterborns, so they dry in the summer. Uh, 
Well, no, just basically just water coming off the off the hills. Generally in the winter, running into the river down that way. We're going to cross over here. You've got loads of it. We're probably in the Cotswolds now. Oxford's not Cotswold because it doesn't sit on that stone, even though all the buildings in Oxford are built from, you know, the university buildings are built from the limestone. Oxford's mainly on clay and something else, I can't remember what. Yeah, that looked like a bird of prey that got hit. Yeah. Now, in America, if you were to take a feather from that, you'd go to jail. Really? Yeah. Wow. Can't even touch them. We have the Migratory Bird Act now. Have you read The Feather Thief? No. The, the guy who broke into the Tring Museum to steal Wallace's birds to sell on eBay. Oh, yeah, I've so heard he, about so it. Yeah. He'd buy a, I mean, the guy's a nerd. He did it to buy a $20,000 flute. But it, it goes through the whole history of the feather craze with hats and just how all the American birds were decimated 150 years ago. And it's the, I think it might be the Migratory Bird Act, but you can't even touch some birds. So many of these little villages in the Cotswolds. Little itty bitty doors. Yeah. People are just tinier? Uh, I just think they're stupid. <laughs> that always used to be the thing, wasn't it? People were shorter in the old days, so the doors were lower. I just think they just made them small, really. Small, Didn't mind ducking their heads to get in. This is sort of similar to rural Virginia, where I'm from. Yeah. It's kind of rolling green hills. It's a lot of horse country. A lot of Hollywood actors have houses and race horses. There you go. So this is the... This is the even load. Jump out and take a photo. No. Just in there. Or... Oh, we'll keep going. I don't know if I could open a door here, it's so narrow. And that's um, that's a river which isn't in great condition really. Because it's been it's been pretty heavily dredged. You know, farmers have dredged it to try and stop the flooding of these the, the surrounding flood plain. Um, and the effect that it's just brewing the habitat, it's slowed the flow of the river down, it's started to become more turbid, it's silted up, you know. Do you fish much? Grasshoppers, beetles, ants? Um, fish ants quite late season quite a lot. That can be a very, very good pattern. Um, we get we do get grasshoppers, crickets, um, but it tends to it tends to be only a couple of days in the season where the fish are really switched on to them. But it's always good to have a few patterns in your box. But ants are a good pattern. If you get a if you get a hatch of flying ants, then you know the fish just go absolutely crazy for you. you know, plus it's a it's a good terrestrial pattern. You know a fly called a cocky bondy? Never heard of a cocky bondy. It's a terrestrial, it's a beetle pattern basically. Oh, there's some crazy bikers. Yeah. That is quite the view. It's lovely, isn't it? I, I don't ever get to experience something like that. It's the best office in the world. Are there any sort of celebrity fly anglers out here or in the UK? Or like notable ones that can draw a crowd for speaking engagements? Um, there's probably the, the best known this guy called Charles Jardine, who pro is pro will probably be at the fly fishing show you go to. He's, um, he's pretty well known. He's a journalist. He's a very um, 
evangelical fly fisherman, does a lot of stuff with kids, fishing for schools and that sort of thing. He's a good guy. He's a good artist as well. You know, paints pictures of trout and stuff like that. Um, apart from him, there's a couple of, of reasonably well-known reservoir fishermen. Um, a guy called Craig Barr, who's got his own fly business. And, you know, and then you've got a guy called John Horsley, who is um, a bit of an all-round fisherman, mainly still waters, does a lot of guiding for pike on Rutland Water, which is a big trout fishery with a lot of pike in it. But uh, I'd say Jardine's probably the, one of the best known as a crop at the moment. We haven't really got a, a big... We haven't really got a, uh, anyone really big at home in writing, you know, like a Goddard or a, anyone like that. No, they all seem to be the previous generation. No one's really coming through, which is a shame. Um, but you know, there's a, quite a lot of um, the famous people fly fish. You know, Eric Clapton's a big fly fisherman. He caught that huge salmon a couple of years ago. Yeah. But we could have been driving in circles for the last 20 minutes, I really wouldn't know. <laughs> it doesn't look the same, doesn't it, to get used to it. You can't, there's another one. There's mine. Well, that's, that looks like scum, maybe. So I know the Cotswolds from like people go out with their walking stick and their socks and a little knapsack. Is that a seasonal thing? Like, not right now. Yeah, you get a you get a, a big bump in tourists in the summer. I saw so a sign that said no walkers. Yeah. It's um it's a big old destination for Cotswolds, you know, because it is so so pretty. And there's there's quite a big tourist business that's been built around that, you know, very um, you know, traditional hotels and pubs and stuff, you know, that really really play on that whole thing. Email. There's one thing I can never have enough of, and that's pheasant tails. Well, if we, uh, we see one on the road, jump out and yeah. pluck it. Pheasant tails for steel. Have you ever done steelhead? Yes. I saw you did the road. Yeah. So we do the Great Lakes. And it's seven seven hour drive, maybe, and a flashback soft tackle pheasant tail. Always get get your big fish. I was surprised how you know big nymphs. You know, like using yeah, I'm using, yeah, I'm using like eights. Yeah. Go and fish down in um, in Mexico. Look up a guy called Rex Schroeder. He's uh, he's an American guy lives down in Tulum, and boy, he, he's a character. He's a real character. Great guy. He um, he does a lot of guiding uh, for mainly on oceans. Um, Sort of surf fishing for, for jacks and snook. Uh, very funny guy. Really good, really good character. Gives you a bit. There. So where are we pulling into now? Right, we're going to go. This is Salford uh, Trout Lakes, and it's um, two stock trout lakes. We're going to go to the upper one first. Have a quick look at that. See if it's worth fishing. If it doesn't look worth fishing, we're going to go to the lower one. What are you going to be looking for? Um, we're going to be just seeing if there's any surface activity, any fish moving about, any fish shoaled up. You know, just basically have a look and see if there's any insect life coming off and the fish are feeding. It's early season, they're normally fairly hungry at this time. It can be relatively easy to catch. The two lakes, the upper lake, this is a place I, I bring a lot of people to. It's, it's very good for, for experienced and novice fishermen. It's not a big water, so it's not very intimidating. You don't necessarily need to cast that far. Um, it's pretty well stocked. It's got rainbows, blues, browns, the, okay, odd, so the odd tiger trout. Blue trout. Yeah. I just read about that in that magazine. What is a blue trout? Blue trout is a genetically modified rainbow. Um, don't ask me how. But it basically gives it a blue sheen, and they tend to be a bit more aggressive and fight harder. Um, it's like one of these hybrids, you know, like a tiger trout is a cross between a brook and a brown. A brown. Um, 
then there's, uh, there's a few others as well. Do you have what, what we call palominos? Not by that name. They're like the creamsicle, orangey, golden trout, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, you get a few a few fisheries stock those. So Pennsylvania and West Virginia, I think they're now in Colorado, which they really shouldn't be. That place should still be kind of pure. It's a good thing you got this car. Yeah. Yeah, you've got to have a four by four if you go out fishing out here, especially in the winter. Everyone seems to have very large nets. Hopefully for very large fish. Right, I'll be going to sign a safe. Give me a second and I'll be back. Okay. Heard that. Oh, we're going to have a look around. Yeah. Oh, look around. Thank you. You can take a look in your net there. I've heard about the blue trout. I want to see one. No. Just a regular rainbow? That's not one. That's a rainbow, yeah. I've, I've caught a blue trout, but I'll put it back. There's one that you can actually, they're quite easy to spot in the water, actually, to be honest, um, when you do see them. But of course, when you're fishing like us, we're here, we stand around for three hours because that's what we're doing. If you're just here to have a good look at them, then you'll get a bit bored after a bit, won't you? But, <laughs> but yeah, there's one or two around. Well, that's the plan. I wouldn't mind catching one while I'm here. Good try and find some trout. How are you rigging up your rod? Okay, so it's nine foot six weight. It's a uh, Sage Z axis. Lovely rod. I had this built from a blank by a really good rod builder called Stephen Parks who now runs a company called Atom6. Watch out for their rods, they're really, really good casting tools. Uh, it's probably London Fly Fishing Fair, actually. Um, floating line, it's a Michael Evans arrow head line. Uh, I don't know if you've got those across the pond, but they're really good lines. Very, very long taper, and really true to weight as well. You can hold a really stable loop, and you can, you can get a lot of line outside the rod tip to keep the cast really stable with these things. Are you all particular about your line collars at all? Um, I tend to find something reasonably neutral. I mean, this is a what's called a, an ivory colour, I guess, of a cream colour. Um, I don't tend to like to use really uh, bright lines, but I'm not to be not really too sure. You know, if you look at any line in, especially against the sky, it's it's always going to look dark. So, you know. um, I do have a, a few brown sort of dun coloured lines for on lighter rods but they're very very difficult to fish on a floating line because you just you just lose sight of the line completely so i think what you might gain from stealth you're going to lose through your ability to control the line what so, sort of uh, pattern do you want to start off with here we're just going to put a damsel on weighted damsel fairly standard pattern we're going to use about a nine foot leader i've got a uh, a nine foot tapered leader cut down to seven foot which is going to do a loop to loop connection down to some uh, 4x tippet. So totally length about between 9 and 10 foot. And then we're going to put a damsel loop on it. Fairly good standard go to pattern. Stanley, come here. So I'm just going to replace the tippet on this. Uh, just a, a straightforward shot bought nylon tapered leader. I mean, I actually buy these things by the two dozen, I pay about a pound per leader. Because yeah, I get through so many. You know, nothing really, nothing really special or secret about the, the composition of leaders. Stanley, come here. Stan, come here. Was that a fish that just That's flew out of the water? Jumping, yeah. <laughs> he really is smiling. Oh yeah, he's happy dog. Would that fish just been leaping to grab something or clean gills or just for fun? Um, I don't know. Let's see if we can catch him in front of it. So we're not going to go too heavy duty on the tippet. We're going to go for 4X. 
is probably about right. You should be fine with that. You know how to play a fish. Um, I use Stroff GTM. Really good tippet material. Just nylon, not fluorocarbon. And I'm just going to do, we've got a loop at the end of the, the tapered leader. It's going to tie a perfection loop in this end on the tippet. A, a normal sort of handshake connection. That guy's on a connection. Oh no, it looked like he was on a fish. Right, flywise. Bring out the still water box here. Can right. I take a picture? Yep. I really wish I'd have brought you some of my damsels. I'll have to mail you some. Have a bunch of Are there any products that you from say America or I don't know Korea, Japan that are hard for people in the UK to get tie materials no we can get pretty much everything here pretty much everything right so I'm going to go for down to with your blue flash in it Stanley come here come here come on just going to go for a pretty standard five turn tuck runner. You said you signed in? Yeah. Is that like to keep a log of who's been here? Yeah. Yeah, I've got um, a membership of this place through my fly fishing club. Stanley, come here. Come here. Come here. Do you ever have problems with riffraff coming in and causing trouble? Not generally, no. But just keep an eye on that central patch of water. Basically, about. 60 feet out, look towards that platform over there and then come back and about 60 feet away from where we are now. Look in that area there. And what we're doing, we're just looking for any surface disturbances. When we haven't got very good light conditions as we have, you know, as in today, then we're really relying on the fish giving their position away through surface activity. I mean, we saw a fish move there and we saw a fish move just further up. Um, I mean, I know from experience that this area off this platform here generally holds fish. There's a bit of a ridge that runs. You can just see that slightly lighter patch yep. over there, and it gets a little bit deeper. And the fish patrol around. They'll also come into this corner here. Um, the wetter fish, again, we've got the just a floating line. You see it shells off. Wow, this deeply. is really clear. Yeah. Stanley, come around here. This side. Good boy. This almost looks like it has an artificial dye to it. It's got a slight green tinge to it, hasn't it? Mm-hmm. Right, so all I do, I mean, you're going you're to be fishing, not me, is let that fly sink, count it down for about five seconds, and then just uh, pluck retrieve like that. One, two, three, stop. One, two, three, stop. See if you pick anything up on that. You're going to find with this long marabou tail that occasionally they'll pluck at the back end of the fly if you feel a fish pull on it don't lift into it just wait till it goes all goes tight so it's almost like a strip strike we've not got a hugely we've not got a hugely um, hard, uh, strong leader on here so you're going to have to play him on the roof so uh, Andy how did the fishing go this afternoon? Uh, a bit slow um, had a couple of hookups but nothing really stuck. The um, wasn't too much surface movement. We had a the air pressure was bouncing up quite a, up and down quite a bit, and noticeably when we had a, an increase in a rise in the air pressure, we saw uh, more fish rising. Um, tricky day. The damsel which we started off with, I think you had a couple of pulls on that, mm -hmm. um, but the fish oh, weren't really taking confidently on that. So a smaller fly bit more interest in that but again not really very confident takes bit of interest you had a quality follows but again nothing nothing really confident and nothing hooking up um, well we did see some surface activity I think it's probably very very small midges that they were taking they were taking just subsurface with a few surface rises as well so I think if we'd um, we'd have stuck around for a bit longer we could have probably cracked it a bit more with the right fly on there um, but yeah, I mean, a nice day out, tricky, 
It's pretty. Yeah. Very clean. No litter. Not thinking about the, the fish probably get eaten by those crayfish instead of the crayfish getting eaten by the fish. But those, I mean, just the head of the crayfish with the claws was like six or seven inches long. Yeah, I mean, a crayfish wouldn't take a the wouldn't take one. a trout. The dead ones probably get the, eaten. Yeah, quickly. but they they would certainly graze on the on any any dead fish. You know, and on a fishery like that, you you do have a, a mortality rate. So you know, you see dead fish at the bottom occasionally and they will be hoovered up very rapidly by the crayfish but there's so much invertebrate, so many invertebrates in that lake in those two lakes that the crayfish are getting very large I mean I think I said about the there are crayfish in pretty much every watercourse in the UK now uh, they're the invasive um, American crayfish which were uh, brought over here for you know to be cultivated uh, back in the 60s and they've just spread and um the negative effect of that is they do eat a lot of the invertebrates and the fly life is going down in a lot of rivers, partly because of crayfish, partly because of pollution and pesticides, etc. One of the plus sides on that is that when trout and we have a fish called a chub, um, when they start to recognise a crayfish as food, then they start eating them and they're very, very high protein. So the size of uh, chub in a lot of rivers has just absolutely doubled over the last about the last five to ten years. You know, when I was when I was younger and fishing, uh, any chub over four pounds would, was fish of a lifetime. And people are regularly catching five, six, seven pound chub now. And that's, that's a big fish. That's, yeah. Do you ever fish that they're like egg patterns to mimic the chubs and the other coarse fish? Um, well, I do a lot of f- fly fishing for coarse fish, and um, the most common. Ones, I mean, I fish for pike a lot, and you also catch perch as well. But the, if you fly fish for chub, then a really good pattern for chub is um, a, a big, big grey wolf. You know, a, a large dry fly pattern just floated down underneath a tree, and these fish will just come up for them. Chub are, chub are great fish to catch on the fly. They're not particularly fast, but they're quite powerful. You have to fish reasonably like tippets because they're quite sensitive to tippet. So they're difficult fish to play. You've got to fish quite a soft rod with them. Otherwise, you will get smashed up by them quite easily because they're, what, they, what they lack in speed, they make up for in strength and lunges, you know, and they'll just give a big head shake and they will always go for snags as well. Are there any flies you wouldn't fish out here? Like, that's embarrassing? Um, we tend to be... We, as I say, the English tend to be quite conservative about fly fishing and um, streamer fishing, as we talked about, isn't really um, practiced very much. What about glow bugs and eggs? Well, more and more... San Juan worm? People are starting to use those in Chernobyl ants and things like that, you know. And boundaries are starting to be broken down about, about people's um, views on what we, should, what we can fish and what we should fish. Um, so... Yeah, people are people are opening their eyes a little bit more to fishing non-traditional patterns. Though, so, you know, There's some of this car that drove off the road. Yeah, that car's that, they really did a number on this one. What was that? No, I've seen these good ones. I mean, it looks like you know, it's some movie like where a monster just threw it down in there. <laughs> yeah. Right. But we have. Um, on the on the rivers we had a, we were looking at, they don't really have too many rules. You can fish upstream, downstream, dry fly, nymphs, wet fly, whatever. Um, on a lot of the southern chalk streams, they're still very traditional, and a lot of them you can only fish dry fly up to a certain time in the season. You can only fish single fly. You have to fish upstream. Um, you can't fish a fly bigger than a than a size ten outside mayfly season when you can go up to an eight if you want. Who regulates that? Um, it's just it's the rules of the of the club or the syndicate or the water. Um, as far as who polices it, and it's self policing, but you'll find a lot of these more expensive chalk stream beats are quite heavily bailiffed. So you know you'll have a river keeper who'll keep an eye on things and anything he doesn't like the look of, you know, you could be in trouble. Anything else about your guide business and fishing here that we didn't discuss yet? Um, I think what's, uh, what I'm trying to do is is really trying to expand the whole fly fishing, perception of fly fishing for 
not just trout, but move it, you know, grayling, coarse fish, carp, you know, and really trying to give people, tell people there are so many more options on what you can actually catch on the fly. As we know, you can catch anything with fins on the fly. Um, a lot of people don't actually realise wow. that. What is that building? That's Bliss Mill. It used to be an old uh, woolen mill. It's now private flats. It's My lovely, isn't it? Goodness. Yeah, so if it, if it swims, you're going to chase it. Exactly, yeah. And, you know, of course, I mean, I've, I've caught a very bizarre fish to catch in a fly. I've caught a tench on a fly, um, which is, is a very odd fish to catch because they are not predatory at all um, and quite tricky to catch if you're bait fishing. So that was a bit of a surprise catch. But, I mean, my, my big things really um, outside trout and grayling are carp and pike, which are... A lot, you know, there's a lot of carp fisheries in the UK, and pretty much every every river and a lot of still waters have pike in them, and they can get pretty big as well. You know, you stand if you go go pike fishing, you stand a good chance of catching a 20 pound fish. That's big. Uh, and they're a lot of fun. They, the way that they strike, you know, if you see a pike strike, you know, the gills just flare, the mouth just hinges open, you know. And they just explode to go for your fly. As you know, they're predatory. They're um, ambush predators. So, you know, they move really quickly. And just where, if you look at a pike, you know, same as a muskie, you've got that dorsal fin right at the back of the body. And that's just to give it that big, single burst of acceleration, you know, a big flick of a tail of a dorsal fin. And these things just hang out at your fly. A lot of fun to fish for. And again, something that's that's relatively in its infancy. Pike are very, um, a very delicate, fly, a de- very delicate fish. You know, they've got this sort of fearsome reputation because they are voracious predators, but they don't stand being caught too many times. They don't stand being ta- being badly handled. I live in Fairfax. Fairfax and Company. Yeah. Named after Lord Fairfax. Oh right, okay. All right, you ready for some non-fishing questions? Yep. Uh, favorite Michael Caine movie. Um, the man who would be king. The best sandwich you've ever eaten. Oh God. Um, there used to be a garage just around the corner from here that made a really, really good um, tomato and uh, egg salad sandwich. That sounds good. What's the worst place you've ever fished? Worst place I've ever fished. You know what? That's a tricky one to answer because I've loved everywhere I've fished. <laughs> if you could go back in time before humans ruined environments and destroy things, you could fish in one place. Where would it be? I'd like to catch a salmon in the Thames because we don't we don't get salmon in the Thames anymore. Well, we don't get a salmon run in the Thames. You get occasional salmon in there, but um, I'd like to be able to catch a salmon out of the Thames. Do you have a favorite author? Uh, I'm very keen on Terry Pratchett at the moment. Uh, I'm reading a lot of his books. Um, And who else do I like? Very British, P.G. Woodhouse. Do you have any irrational phobias? Fingernails. People clipping them or like fingernails? No, just just fingernails. You know, it's like stuff under your fingernails. Not dirt, but like, you know. Just one of those things that makes your teeth, puts your teeth on edge fingernails. What's something you refuse to eat? Uh, cucumber. Pickles, too? No, I love pickled gherkins, but I hate cucumber. Bizarre. My wife can't understand it. If you left one item at home on a fishing trip that would ruin your day, what would it be? My glasses, because I wouldn't be able to see to tie flies on. Okay, uh, that's probably all the random questions I can think of. I usually have a list. Ones, actually. Yeah, I have a <laughs> list. Uh, how about hot dogs? You put ketchup or mustard on them? Mustard. All right. That's it. Where can we find you on social media? How can people hire you for a day? Okay, I'm andygrayflyfishing.com, and it's Andy Gray spelt with, spelt with an E. Uh, if you do a search for that, or if you do a search for fly fishing in the Cotswolds, I'll come up pretty high on any Google search on that. So I found you. Brilliant. Okay, thank you. It works then. That. Absolutely. Well, this was a pretty awesome day. Good. I really had a good time excellent well I'm glad I got a chance to show you around and have a look at some of the fishing we do in the UK yeah. um, we looked at some rivers and we looked at some still waters and a big reservoir so you know hopefully it's given you a bit of an appetite to come back over rod next time is Stanley tired 
Stanley is absolutely on his knees at the moment, but he's had a lovely day as well. Fantastic. All right, Andy, thanks so much. It's been a pleasure. Thank you for joining us for the Fly Fishing Consultant Podcast. For more information or to contact Rob, please go to www.robsnowwhite.com. This podcast is brought to you by Freestone Productions at freestoneproductions.com.